Good morning, friends. I've decided in all this enforced seclusion that I'm lonely and I need people to talk to. I'm Asha Nayaswamy and I'll be chatting with you for a half an hour this morning, tomorrow morning, and maybe several mornings a week. We'll just see if there's interest in how things flow. And my dear friend and colleague Shanti Rubenstone will also take a turn in front of the camera on some days of the week. So I was trying to give thought to how to approach um, the times we're living in uh, in a way that would be not only helpful for the moment, but uh, solving problems in the direction that we really want to go. One of my dear guru bhais, Haridas, who with his wife Roma has been for some years living in India, their head of the Bangalore Center. Um, Haridas has been part of Ananda longer than I've been. He was, he was in place when I arrived. And uh, he's always been exceedingly clever in the way he takes these teachings and puts them into something that you can both laugh at and remember. And one of his uh, early acronyms was called Spy Dog, is how he called it. And he taught us all, um, suggested to all of us, that we follow the tenets of Spy Dog whenever we're faced with a challenge in life. And the acronym, is that the right word, acronym, when the letters mean a sentence? Okay, uh, the acronym Spy Dog means Solve Problems in Direction of God. In other words, whatever you're faced with, always take a solution that not only deals with that issue, but also draws you up to a higher level, which, so that you use everything in your life to take you to a place where you really want to go. Um, it's, it's sort of obvious when you think about it, but so often we solve problems in a direction that's not the direction of God. Um, and sometimes we have no choice. And sometimes the direction of God is not very elevated, but it's still higher than throwing ourselves off a bridge or whatever else might be the alternative or the equivalent of that within our own hearts. Eating half the carton of ice cream sometimes is actually in the direction of God rather than eating the whole carton of ice cream. I am, have on occasion in my life deliberately put some tempting morsel down the garbage disposal. <laughs> and that, that was just the way of dealing with it. I'm amused. I was reading. I, I do writing myself. I've written four books. In fact, I'm going, to, I'm, going to, I'm going to do a sequence here, which you'll follow. This book is called Light Bearer, and it's the story of my 45 years with Swami Kriyananda. <laughs> it's... It's a very heavy book. It's 240, 220,000 words, but you might have a lot of time on your hands now. It's available on e-form, much lighter, through Amazon, and also there's an audio book of it. And many people tell me the audio book is their favorite version of it. This book had a great uh, flash when it came out in the summer, but it hasn't gotten the attention I think it should have. So I'm going to be mentioning it periodically, shamelessly. Okay. Also, there's audiobooks of uh, two other of the four books I've written, and they're downloadable for free on my website, Asha Joy, if you go there. Now, coming back to, I do some writing myself, and that's how I'm going to use this time, too. Uh, and the issue of writer's block and writer's procrastination has always been of great interest to me, being a participant in that. And I was so amused by a... a uh, a writer who said, uh, first, her first thing she said is, thank heaven for writing deadlines, because otherwise I'd never get any of my housework done. <laughs> Meaning, <laughs> when the job is in front of you to do, you'll do anything but. And the other thing she said is, whenever I sit down to write, she said, persistently, somewhere in the house, a piece of chocolate is calling my name. <laughs> and I just, I loved the picture that that presented of just how funny the mind is. Now, coming back to solving problems in direction of God. So we find ourselves globally with a fairly big problem in front of us. And there's going to be lots of ways that we'll try to um, deal with it, both individually and collectively, governmentally. I mean, it's, it's, um, if we were impersonal enough to just stand back, it's really it's going to be a fascinating unfoldment of history. But in any case, each of us individually also has to deal with exceedingly changed circumstances. 
a lot of fear, a lot of time on her hands. And there's this wonderful book that Swami Kriyananda wrote, one of 140 books that he wrote. This is called Affirmations for Self-Healing. Those of you who are familiar with Ananda Sunday services know that we every week we read one of these. He, I believe he wrote this, 52 of these affirmations and every week we have a quality of a, for the week that we excuse me include in our Sunday service so recently over the course of the year long before oops I have the here it is long before um, the present um, adventure was launched um, I myself was facing some very challenging personal situations with the work that we're doing here, a great deal of confusion with my guru bhais, just things that were making it very hard for me to sleep. And so I, I needed, uh, I, I was looking for an affirmation that I could use earlier in my life, and even still, an affirmation that has served me extremely well has been, I know that God's power is limitless, and as I am made in his image, I too have the strength to overcome all obstacles. And that served me, still serves me, and served me for decades as a way of, of focusing my frantic thoughts. So I, I went through this book carefully, looking for affirmations that would help me. And it was very interesting, because the, the one I just, I just told you came from Master's book, uh, Scientific Healing Affirmations. But I was going through Swamiji's book looking for affirmations and it was interesting to me that what I found most useful is actually the prayers, uh, which are also absolutely beautiful, just have a slightly different feeling. But every time on Sunday when we have read uh, Swami's two paragraphs describing each quality and then the affirmations, it's always been obvious to me that there was an entire story that could be told about each one. So. In this satsang and tomorrow, um, I'm going to look at qualities here. Unless, of course, you send in questions. Do feel free to send in questions. So today I want to talk about positive thinking. And I'm going to first just read the two paragraphs that Swami wrote, just so we'll have them in our mind. As we think, so we become. And as we think, so our lives and circumstances become also. From the divine consciousness come answers to all our questions and solutions to all our problems. It is in lower consciousness that confusion reigns. Think positively in everything you do, for in that way you help to attune yourself to the divine flow. One who is inwardly in tune with grace finds all things harmonious and beneficial being attracted to him. Positive thinking combined with the sense of divine attunement is never presumptuous, for it derives its power not from the ego, but from the consciousness of God's joy within. So now I want to speak for a few minutes, and this book is also available on Amazon or uh, through Ananda Publications, and if you don't own it, I highly recommend it. probably doesn't look like this. This is an old copy. Um, I want to just talk about what positive thinking is, because in this circumstance, it's a, it's a very nuanced idea, because it says positive thinking draws to us harmonious and beneficial solutions. But what we have to understand is that harmonious and beneficial is from the point of view of the soul. And, and true harmony and true benefit is not what comforts and pleases the ego, which is therefore it's not necessarily what we ourselves have written down as the ideal answer. So we're Haridas. We have to solve our problems in the direction of God. And so Amiji speaks of attunement, and, and the other words are faith. And there is also a word which is a very subtle word, which is the word surrender. And surrender doesn't mean um, an abject kind of collapsing. It means a very dynamic um, self-offering of our, our little realities into a much higher reality. Now, in a situation like this, the, the distinction that we have to understand is the difference between positive thinking and wishful thinking. Because wishful thinking resists circumstances as they are 
and imagines just by my ego's desire I can make things different. And wishful thinking is we all want it. We want our loved ones to be safe. We want our finances to be secure. We want to have a home to live in. I mean, these are the most natural things in the world. But to presume that our soul's best interest is exactly parallel, parallel to our ego's preferences is a mistake. And if we make our faith in God based upon His fulfilling on our terms, our prayers, then, we, then, then our, our position is rather nebulous because we, 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 the ego often doesn't know what's really in its best interest. You know, we, um, we use the image of father and mother as, uh, as the images for God. And there's countless reasons, and in a half an hour talk, I can't follow every thread in the direction that I'd, as much as I'd like to. But part of the reason we think of God as father and mother is because of the child's understanding that there, are, there is a reality of greater wisdom, greater experience, and a broader perspective than the child himself or herself can bring to the situation. So when we think of Divine Mother, or we think of Heavenly Father, it's not um, an anthropomorphic image. It's the ideal of impersonal wisdom, the ideal of unconditional love. And if we surrender, which is to say offer up the best that we have, and the best that we have includes our wishful thinking, it's completely sincere to say to Divine Mother, please protect those that I love. You know, please protect me from the things I'm fearful about. But, well, Jesus himself said it perfectly. And, and positive thinking is, is Jesus himself. When in the Garden of Gethsemane, when he knew the crucifixion was coming, and he knew, not for himself, but he knew how devastating it would be for his disciples, and how, how heartrending it was for him that he had brought this divine message and it was going to be rejected so fiercely. So he said, Lord, let this cup pass from me. Let this bitter cup of, of disappointment and the continuing suffering of others, it's a bitter cup for Jesus to have to drink, given his tender heart and his desire to help them. Let this cup pass from me. So he surrendered himself. He offered himself into God. But then he said, But thy will not mine be done. So our, what our positivity is, is that we dynamically do every useful thing that we can think of to do. Positive thinking is positive action. Positive thinking isn't just sitting there sort of assuming that if we tell God how we want it, it's going to be. That's wishful thinking. Positive thinking recognizes that thinking must be supported by emotional and intellectual and physical action if possible. Every good option that makes any sense to follow should be followed. And then positive thinking is faith. Positive thinking is knowing that, that Divine Mother is my comforter. Heavenly Father is my guide. And I put myself in their hands. And I act with their inner guidance. That's what Swami talks about. See, positive thinking puts us in tune. Because thoughts are universal. And whatever vibration we, we uh, connect with, that vibration continues to feed us. Which is why once we're sad and depressed, Everything supports being sad and depressed. And I, I was just thinking this morning, people with a lot of time on their hands, all of us with a lot of time on our hands, um, where I am in California, at least at the moment, everything's shut down. And we've been told to um, shelter in place, you know, to be home as much as possible. Fortunately, being a writer, I have a, a creative outlet that is entirely self-sufficient, 
But all of us are going to have to seriously and conscientiously find ways to keep our energy up and positive. That's why I'm starting with positive energy. What can we do that uh, brings a, a positive flow of energy? Because when we're on the positive flow of energy, then we will attract to ourselves other thoughts and feelings that are also on that same positive flow of energy. The solution I'm going to suggest now at the moment may not be accessible to us, but the principle is there. Someone came to me for counseling once and their situation was uh, extremely bleak. It was when she described to me everything that was happening to her. Problems in her relationship, problems with money, um, problems with health of the people that she loved. It was uh, problems with her job. And sort of after she described it all, I said, well, the good news, I said, is this is a hundred percenter. And she looked sort of horrified. I said, because God is clearing the slate. He's just, he, everything that you've been, it seems to me he's, he's moving it all away. So you can either look at it as a total disaster, or you can try to find in the midst of what appears to be a total disaster, you know, how can I just turn this in my mind into, into just even the slightest bit of positive light? And that, that's the game that we're all going to have to play. What can we pull out of what is admittedly not very bright circumstances and honestly could get worse? You know, there's no guarantee that we're at the end of this. Um, and there's a lot of indication that we're at the beginning. Um, I, we now have, uh, you know, when it, when the news could get worse, but the attitude doesn't have to get worse. We can solve every problem in the direction of God. There was a, a, a comment made by a rabbi m recently commenting on what happened to the Jews um, during the Second World War, the Holocaust, as it is called, which by every measure was tragic on a scale that it's hard for the human heart to grasp. But he made the extremely insightful comment. He said, you know, the Jewish people lost everything. He said, the only thing we didn't lose is our relationship with God. And he said, in certain ways, it was our shining hour because every Jewish person had the opportunity to prove to himself that if he had God, he had everything. Now that is solving problems in the direction of God. That's a hero's response. And that response does not come without a lot of dark days and nights. And so positive thinking is also, I say, not only, it's not expecting more of yourself than you're capable of giving, but also believing that God can empower us on a level that we might not have known was there. I've had some challenging times in my life and long days and nights. You know, I've not been able to uh, follow my own advice quickly. But it's partly because I've known, I've learned that good advice sometimes comes to fruition slowly that I have a deeper understanding even of what it means to have positive thinking. Positive thinking is sometimes just being collapsed on the ground and not being able to get up, even for quite some time. But it's way down deep, way down deep, knowing that when everything else is gone, God is still there. Going back to the Holocaust, there's a woman named Cory Tenboom and she and her sister Betsy were Christians in Holland. And when the Nazis took over and began to exterminate the Jews, they became part of an underground and saved many, many, many people. But in the end, Corey and her sister Betsy and their father Casper were all taken to a concentration camp. Casper died immediately. He was elderly. Betsy died after a couple of years, and Corey survived. And just before Betsy died, well, two things happened. She told Corey 
that they had to pray and pray very deeply for all those in the camps. And Corey assumed that Betsy meant all the Jewish people who were in prison there. And only slowly did she realize that Betsy was talking about the guards because the victims were not perpetrating the evil and therefore their challenge was only to be strong in the face of it. But those who were perpetrating the evil would have so much to pay for what they had done that Betsy's compassion went first to them. Now you see, that was also Jesus on the cross. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. He was actually interceding that those who were the instruments of putting him to death, he was concerned for their spiritual well-being too. Now that is really solving our problems in the directions of God. Now we're in a situation where our fate is out of our hands, but it's not out of God's hands. It's not really in the hands of anyone but God. That's positive thinking. That's not wishful thinking. That's truth. And we're all going to have an opportunity, perhaps, God willing, we won't be challenged to the end, but we'll see. Now, what I found, the affirmation that goes with here is very positive, of course. My outer life is a reflection of my inner thoughts. Filled with the joy of God, I express his joy and harmony in everything I do. A fabulous affirmation. And if it speaks to you, by all means, use it. But what I found and have found over the last year before this recent opportunity came to us is the prayer. Problems cannot exist, Lord, whenever thou art near. Give me strength always to hold thee in my heart. This has provided for me such a deep and wonderful meditation. Problems cannot exist, Lord, when thou art near. Now what that's saying is that the owner, that doesn't mean that outer situations will change. It means that our perception of them as problems will be shifted by the closeness we feel from the divine. And the, the, the aggravating thing about life, and I just don't know, I, I myself have not come to peace with it, and I'm comforted by the fact that Master was not at peace with us, this Master used to chide Divine Mother. He said, why must you teach your children through suffering? And I feel if Master himself could speak to Divine Mother that way, then I certainly have a right to. But I have to say, and reluctantly I have to admit it, the spiritual lessons that I've learned from profound and deep disappointment and suffering I could never have learned them. And I wish that weren't true. I really wish it weren't true. But the ego is a, is a tough customer. And really, sometimes we just have to be pushed beyond the point where, you know, we have to be pushed to the shining hour when the only thing left to us is our relationship with God. And when we feel that, you know, this, this world is a dream. This world is a, an instant in time. It, it, it stretches on for a very long time while we're living it. But then we move out of it. My friend Bella, when she was in the last days of her life, she said, she told a friend, she said she was lying there literally on her deathbed. And she said she saw thousands of faces passing before her, and every face had been hers. Every face represented an incarnation that was as real and as intense and as dear to her as the one which was just about to culminate. And she said it was very difficult for her to cling to the face she was wearing when confronted with all the faces she had worn. Now this is our relationship to God. This is positive thinking. This is true positive thinking. A simple way that I often put it is, if it isn't a happy ending, it's not actually the ending. Now that doesn't mean that life won't end. That doesn't mean that 
attachments won't be taken away. It just means that the story's not over, that this is a, a challenging chapter on the way to the happy ending. Problems cannot exist, Lord, when thou art near, meaning if you are close to me, problems cease to exist in my consciousness. Then comes the prayer, give me the strength, Lord, always to hold thee in my heart. And that's what, that's what we have to pray for. Give me the strength, Lord, always to hold thee in my heart. Help me not to forget that I have a Divine Mother to comfort me and a Heavenly Father to guide me. And give me the strength to hold you close or if I lose contact with thee, to find thee quickly again. I mean, that is the solution to what we're facing. Everything else is temporary. You know, a friend of mine, uh, actually it was Jyotish, who's now the Swami's successor in Ananda, many uh, years ago, many, many years ago, he lived in uh, this dome, which later burned down in the fire of 1976 at Ananda Village, and that dome just leaked like a sieve. And during those years we had a great deal of rain at Ananda Village. This was before he was married to Davy, so they were married in uh, 1974, I think, so very early in Ananda. And it was winter, and it was a torrential rainstorm. And Jyotish was sick. He'd had a bad cold. And I went over just to see how he was doing. And he was sitting in his house, and he was sitting in his comfortable chair. Uh, and he had a lamp, and he was reading. Very self-contained, I remember the image. And the... He had, he had developed this system where he had he'd put a series of uh, pipes or some kind of catchments and then pipes so that, and oh, he had a big funnel. That's what I remember. He had a giant funnel which was catching most of the water that was leaking into the house. Then he had a tube on the funnel and it went across like this and then it went into the sink so that instead of the water pouring into the house, it poured into the funnel, went through the tube, and went down the sink. And it was so jerry-rigged and so ridiculous. <laughs> and I looked at it, and all this rain, and it was like a river running through the house, because you could hear all this water running. And he was just quite calmly reading his book. I said, Jyotish, how can you stand this? Now, I, of course, lived in even more primitive circumstances, so I don't even know why I was exclaiming, but dry was sort of my bottom line on things. I just lived in this tiny trailer, which was absolutely perfect. We all lived very humbly, to put it mildly. I said, Jyotish, how can you stand this? And he smiled at me and he said, you know, I can, I, can, I can handle any situation, he said, as long as I know that it's temporary. And he said, when you stop and think about it, he said, everything except God is temporary. And he was Joking, but not joking. Solve problems in the direction of God. We have this illusion that the world is going to stay the way we want it. Like, we just get it all organized, and then, by Jove, it's going to stay there. In 1989, there was an earthquake here in uh, Palo Alto, where I still live. The building was shaking, and my mind told me that the problem was the building. So I ran out of the building, and, and I watched the earth undulate. And I watch the trees going, in, you know, in ways that they don't usually go. And I watch the water in the swimming pool, half the water in the swimming pool, come in a wave over the fence. And it was like, oh, there's no security anywhere. When the earth itself moves, there's no security anywhere. Give me the strength, Lord, always to hold you close in my heart. Let that be our prayer. God bless you.